got the airplane pre flighted and everything, so we're ready to go. All we need to do is jump in and head for Houston. Pass you, sir. This is John Denver inviting you to climb aboard and join us for a trip that can only be described as far out. We've got a date today with a dream, one of man's oldest, the dream of flight. We're going to go places today where even the birds have never been. We'll be doing everything from ballooning to barnstorming to blasting off. Along the way, we'll meet some heroes, a couple of geniuses, and some people like you and me. But most of all, I can promise you we're going to have some fun. I hope you folks recognize me, but I'm not sure you recognize the gentleman on my right. He's my father, Dutch Dutchendorf. He's been a pilot all his life. He taught me how to fly. Simply couldn't do this film without him. For a long time, I couldn't even get him in an airplane. Now, can't keep him out of it. Yeah, but I tell you what, I think he enjoys it as much as I do. You can say that again. <laughs> Want you folks to sit down, strap your seat belts on. Over the next hour, we're going to take you to a few places you've probably never been before. You better hang on, because we're going to be going for it. That's it. We're going to fire up a balloon and float over the Colorado Rockies. We'll take a sentimental journey back to Kitty Hawk to fly an exact reproduction of the Wright Brothers' original flyer. We're going to find out what made those daring young men and women so daring back in the romantic days of barnstorming. And for a fantastic thrill, we'll plunge through the sound barrier in one of the world's fastest jets. So check those seat belts again, because this flight is ready to go. these took man beyond the pull of gravity to float free on the edge of space. By the end of the decade, the rock-covered moon had become a stepping stone to infinity. Who can say where the space shuttle will take us tomorrow? At Palomar Observatory, we'll peer into the depths of space and wonder at the possible life forms we may discover there. experience the thrill of flying the highest performance jets and then we'll just lie back a little and enjoy the fun of floating over the Rockies or rocking into a barrel roll. We'll even get a little hilarious at New York's Rhinebeck Aerodrome where expert pilots spoof the legendary aces of World War I. You don't have to be the Red Baron to figure out that everybody from Rickenbacker to von Richthofen gets kitted in these weekend melodramas. us for a couple of hundred years. In those brave old days, though, the way you did it was to carry a bonfire in a basket under a highly flammable bag made of paper or cloth. If it strikes you that it wasn't the safest way of getting off the ground, you're right. But at the time, it was the only way. In recent years, the development of the propane burner and flame proofing has been responsible for putting balloons back in the air. This ancient pastime has now become a safe, spectacular, and enormously popular sport. Rallies like this one at Snowmass, Colorado, now bring balloonists together all over the world. Here at Snowmass, the high Rockies provide a majestic backdrop for these colorful giants. If anybody asks you what time the balloon is going up, you're generally safe if you tell them right after sunup since the wind conditions for hot air ballooning are best soon after dawn. It's the kind of sport that gets you up early. Let me goose it one time. The very first time we actually got off the ground, it wasn't on the Wright Brothers' wings. In fact, it was before the combustion engine was even a good idea. 
It was way back on November 21st, 1783, right? Right. In a hot air balloon. <laughs> Hang on. Everybody up. Here you go. We're still doing it today because it's great. When the Montgolfier brothers sent their first balloon up in Paris in 1783, it drew an enormous crowd. Among the onlookers was Benjamin Franklin, our ambassador to France at the time. As the balloon rose into the air, someone asked Franklin, of what possible use is it? And Franklin's answer, as usual, was right to the point. Of what possible use, he replied, is a newborn baby. Well. Floating along in the breeze, suspended from a bubble of hot air, is great fun, but don't ever confuse it with powered, controlled flight. It took 120 years following that first balloon ascension in 1783 and the genius of the Wright brothers to solve the riddle of the ages and get man off the ground in powered flight for the first time. A hot air balloon can get you off the ground, but what about wings? Men have always envied birds their place in the sky, but it took two bicycle mechanics from Ohio, Wilbur and Orville Wright, to show us how to join the birds in powered flight. Here on Kill Devil Hill near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, we've returned to the exact spot where the Wright brothers' original flyer first took to the air on that historic December 17th in 1903. My dad and I have returned here, along with some friends, to see if we can make history repeat itself. With my wife Annie here to give encouragement, and dad supplying plenty of supervision, we're off to a good start. We're all here to join Ken and Nancy Kellett, a young couple from Colorado. Ken has built an exact replica of the original Wright Flyer. My dad seems to feel that the untried replica may be just as dangerous to fly as the original. We're here to answer the same question the Wright brothers must have asked themselves on that December day in 1903. Will it fly? Mm -hmm. To really appreciate the giant step the Wright brothers took here at Kitty Hawk, it helps if you imagine someone asking you to design an airplane and you had never seen one. Since their flyer had no wheels, it was launched from a trolley on a greased skid. We'll be doing it the same way. The brothers were far from being ordinary bicycle mechanics who somehow stumbled onto the airplane through dumb luck. It took years of study and experimentation and repeated failure before they got it right. And along the way, danger was a constant companion. To attempt to take off from the same spot as the Wright brothers has to give you a feeling of awe. If this flyer takes to the air, it will be like leaving hallowed ground. By today's sophisticated standards, that attempt may look like a failure. But when the Wrights flew that long in 1903, few would believe it had happened at all. I guess everybody in love with flying wants to go farther, faster, and higher. I know we're ready to give it another try. It was a strange combination of Wilbur's noticing the way a buzzard's wingtip turned down as it banked in flight, and his twisting a long box from which he was unpacking a bicycle inner tube that led the brothers to a momentous breakthrough. They theorized that by twisting or warping the wingtips, they might be able to keep the machine on an even keel. This they accomplished by cleverly rigging a set of cables which the pilot could control by shifting his hips. last flight of the day does a little damage, but the original flyer also cracked up before the technique was perfected. But it flew. It flew, yeah. Well, listen, I tell you what, I really admire anybody that sets out to do something and goes for it and does it. And you did that. You, you built that airplane, you made it fly, you proved you could do it. I congratulate you. Thanks, John. 
heck of a job. Once the first plane was off the ground, everybody wanted to get into the act. The idea of flying took off overnight. Hiya, folks. Guess who? <laughs> These biplanes are replicas of what back in the 1930s and 40s were simply the hottest thing in the sky. In fact, now that I think of it, it might have been the only thing in the sky back in those days. In any case, replicas like this Steen Skybolt and the fifth special behind me are being used today by pilots to enjoy what I consider the purest, truest, and rawest form of flying. Now, my friend Chris Woods and I are going to go take these things out and show you what barnstorming is all about. You ready, Chris? You bet, John. Let's do it. <laughs> It was in planes like these that a generation of daring young men and women barnstormed and wing-walked their way across the heartland of the country. Along the way, they sold rides. Two and a half dollars for a flight with no frills, an extra five bucks for stunts. But most important, they sold the idea of flying. Their enthusiasm turned out to be contagious, and since then, America has never been quite the same. You know, the old-time pilot's white silk scarf wasn't an affectation. It's a relic of the First World War. Fighter pilots wore them to keep their necks from getting chafed as they continually turned their heads to look for enemy planes. You want to give it a try, John? No, I, <laughs> I don't think so. I'm not quite ready for that yet. I'm learning. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, I think. See, I'll try to do things so far. Tell you what, Chris, I got a different treat for you, though. Why don't you follow me? I'll give you a little tour of these mountains. We'll go dance with them. Okay, I'm right behind you. Isn't this beautiful? Look, Chris, this mountain here on the right is Capitol Peak. We'll go up through this notch here and make a little bit of a left turn and go back out over the next shoulder. may be building them hotter and faster now. In fact, we'll fly one of the fastest jets in the world in a couple of minutes, 
but for sheer unadulterated fun, give me an old barnstormer any day. We've come to the 1099th Physiological Training Flight Center here at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. to begin training for flight in the supersonic F-15 Eagle. 30? I can't wait. I'm yeah. so excited about this. John, I think we've covered all the necessary material in the classroom and we're ready to go in the chamber. Any questions you have uh, at this time? Well, no, I'm just kind of anxious to see all of this applied to experience it. You know? If you think those barnstormers were fast, you ain't seen nothing yet. Lieutenant Colonel Frank Mayberry, the Chief of Physiological Training here at Andrews, is going to check me out in his high altitude chamber. This pressure cooker can simulate all the conditions of high altitude flight right here at ground level. We're going to find out how the pilots of today's hottest aircraft learn to avoid or deal with such high altitude killers as decompression sickness or a shortage of oxygen, which is called hypoxia. You will not. You'll have a super IP and you're going to be in good hands. Okay, sir, we got our act together. So we're fixing to make our asset now. Very good. Here we go. Let's start the tan chamber up there. John, you got a cup down? Yes, sir. Sergeant McCain, are you ready? Okay. We're going to take your altitude chamber up to 35,000 feet if you want. Roger, sir. Here we go. Then when we get our denitrogenation completed, then we get our ascent to altitude. It's the only time in an altitude chamber that you will be purposely exposed to the area of decompression sickness. So at this time, if you're ready, why don't you just reach up, push the button, drop the oxygen mask down from the side of your face. All right. Yes, we're so close any time. Go ahead and you feel. Is it relatively comfortable? Okay. It's not suffocation, but I feel not getting the amount of air that I'm used to getting when I breathe. It's okay? Yes, yes very fine. If everybody's ready, here in about 15 or 20 seconds, we are going to experience a rapid change in pressure. Here we go. Back on oxygen? Okay. Yes, sir. That's not bad at all. Mark, when you want that on. Hands? Yeah. You have full recovery. You can knock it out of emergency if you would like to, John. I notice that one, you're getting better each time you don your oxygen mask. That's the typical of uh, familiarity with the equipment. Yeah, we're coming in 8,000, sir. Yes, sir. Well, John, the altitude chamber flight is complete. Fastest, great job, and good flying in the F-15. I can't wait, sir. Thanks very much. Handshake, that's it. All right. Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. Home of the 2700th Fighter Squadron. The oldest fighter squadron in the Air Force. And the one I'll be flying with. As my dad and I roll past the parked planes, eagles they're called, I can't help thinking it's nice to see some eagles that aren't on anybody's list of endangered species. If Orville and Wilbur could only see how the baby has grown, I still can't believe that I am actually going to be flying one of them. Here to meet us, the commander of the 1st Tactical Fighter Unit, Colonel Don Miller, and his associate, Colonel Doug Priester. J.D., you probably wonder why we've hung you in this thing called suspended agony. Yes, I certainly understand the term, and what is the deal? You guys mad at me? Oh, no, John, uh, all of us go through this training. Everybody gets it. Okay. Uh, you've <laughs> got to go through a parachute simulation before you go fly your Eagle jet. Great. Okay, John, now that you've gone through the egress trainer, you bailed out the aircraft, now you've got a lot of sense relief, the parachute's yes. over your head, now what do you do? Okay, first... Here to get me out of this mess, and into his airplane, I hope, is Lieutenant Colonel George Dvorak. Flanking him, Captains Frank Pickert and Rose Staten. If I'm in the wires, I don't want to hang anything. I should just wriggle a little bit. I ought to slip right down through. If I don't, just hang there and be cool. And I'm ready to fly. Let's go. I'm ready. John, you know, you're flying with the 27th Fire Squadron, the oldest fire squadron in the Air Force. The oldest. Flying the newest airplane. Flying the newest airplane. All right. Thanks, you guys. Check six. Yes, check six. Frank.
Frank will be right along to help straighten you out in the back there, okay? Great. flight to remember. You know, it's almost impossible for the mind to comprehend that we've come from the Kitty Hawk Flyer to this baby, which knives through the air somewhere close to three times the speed of sound, and all in the same century. Flying this plane is a little like riding a bolt of lightning. If I had noticed how fast Colonel Dvorak got out, I might have been ready for the aftershock. Well, I guess that makes me a baptized member of the 2700th, and I'm proud to be. This sculpture is called Ad Astra, and it means to the stars. And that's what this place is all about. This is the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institute here in Washington, D.C. And this is the most incredible museum I've ever been in. Everywhere you look around here are fantastic dinosaurs of, of space and flight. I mean, that's, that's the real Kitty Hawk flyer, you know? Over here is the spirit of St. Louis the X-15 rocket plane that bridged the gap between man and the stars, the Pioneer spacecraft, 
More people have visited this museum than any other museum in the world. Over 33 million people since it opened in 1976. I'm here because this place supports one of the things that I really strongly believe in, and that's our continued exploration of space. I mean, this is like a, a grand history of American achievement, keeping the memories alive in our hearts and in our minds. Nine, eight, seven, all engines are started. Two, one, zero, we have a liftoff. The Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. Oh, I have slipped the surly bond of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I fly. Sun split clouds and done a hundred things. I've wheeled and soared and swung high in the sun that's silent. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft. This place is a reminder of the mind-boggling places that we've already been, but even more importantly, it's an inspiration for the challenges that lie ahead. Above the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even And while with silent lifting mind I trod the high untrespassed sanctities, put out my hand and touch the face of God. those challenges, NASA's giant space shuttle, the world's first reusable spaceship. And you've got control of the airplane. Okay, got it. And I'm holding 240 knots. Designed to blast off like a rocket and land like a glider, this is our ticket to the future. But you'll see for yourselves, we're about to leave on a simulated flight into space. Roger. Show a 36, I'm on line. Look at the Mach number, 3.4. Now, this thing is really moving at this time, and we're coming down rapidly. We're at 83,000 feet, 290 knots now. Okay, we're going to ask you to give us a nice, gentle 30-degree bank turn when you get up to the heading alignment circle. Roger. Hello, Columbia, Chase 1 on board. Okay, I'm starting to see a runway up here. Got 265 knots. We're lined up, 12,000 feet. I'll arm the landing gear. All right, and it's asking for that uh, little pitch down to get uh, 290 knots. Roger. There, we're at 300 knots. We're looking good. We're at 7,000 feet. Designed for Earth orbital flights of up to 30 days each, 
The shuttle can carry seven people and 65,000 pounds of payload, including research equipment for studying astronomy, weather, and communications, among other things. Now, okay. Go ahead and let the nose come on down. Wheels are on their way. Nose coming up. 400 feet. 300 feet. 250. 200. 150. 100. 80. 70. 8. 40. 30. 20. 5. 5. 3. 2. Straight down. Out. Okay, nose wheel on the ground. We'll steer back over the runway center line. Okay, John, you're on the ground. Looks good. Okay, folks, keep your seats. Next stop, Palomar, and a thrilling look into infinity. I'm on Palomar Mountain, riding the dome of the Hale Telescope. Now, people call this the world's greatest eye because its powers are so enormous. It collects the light of a million human eyes. It can pick up candlelight at a distance of 10,000 miles. It can see 10,000 million light years into space. I mean, far out. Come on inside with me. We're about to look 8 billion light years into space. And here to guide us through the galaxies, world-renowned astronomer, Dr. Jesse Greenstein. Hi, John. How do you, you like, like it, it there? Well, I think this is pretty far out, sir. You want to uh, start turning the dome uh, okay. just to see how that works? First, we, before right. we do that, we've got to open it. All right. So let's get the opening. That's right. Look at that. Now, the whole roof moves independently of That's the telescope. Right. That's it? right. It takes a skilled operator, and of course, then the first thing you want to do is open the mirror cover. If you want to do that, that switch is right over here. Okay. Why don't you just push the switch away from you? You'll hear a noise opening this 200-inch mirror to the sky. Look at that. That's really the heart of the telescope, it is. that incredible mirror. They're pie-shaped segments that uh -huh. one goes over another, like an iris in a sense. Isn't that amazing? Okay, I think it's about time now we could get into the cage. And we, we get go? to take a look. We get to take a look. You can actually see you have a view piece here. Yeah, we, we have an eyepiece which is used mainly for centering of the field. Yeah. We tend not to actually look during any serious observation. Uh -huh. if the Hale telescope weighs 530 tons, but it's so delicately balanced that the tiny motor which moves it generates only one twelfth of a horsepower. The best thing since this seat is tilted at a crazy angle now, but it'll be more comfortable later, is just back in. Now I can hold on, there's nothing... Hold on in everything, except for one button, which you can't risk. Okay, I'm fine. a little sideways here, That's actually. That's all right. Are we hitting it? Good. No, sir. All right, now see if you can get your eye up to that eyepiece here where the right light... Right here? Yes. Now what am I going to see? What am I looking at? You're looking, oh, just at a star 10,000 times brighter than the sun or something. It's in the it's Andromeda. You've seen the Andromeda. Is that right? You mean this is a star in Andromeda? That's right. That's right. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. We sell them. At least we <laughs> hope we're not I beg kidding. your pardon. <laughs> far. In 1919, astronomers saw something only visible during a total solar eclipse. The sun's gravity bends passing starlight. Astronomer Edwin Hubble's later discovery that the furthest galaxies move the fastest added further confirmation of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Einstein and Hubble had redefined the universe. You see now how we can move yeah, to any part of the out. sky. Now if you lean forward, I think you can see this object in the distant system. Before us, a gigantic nebula the spectacular remnant of an ancient stellar explosion. Wow. What we are seeing in the night sky may be the death of a star, a long past event, the light of which is only just now reaching us. 
Not even the stars are eternal. Stars live and die. It's a Us. living and a living entity. As far as I'm concerned, the stars are life in the universe. The star out, yeah. is born out of dust and gas. It lives and it dies. What is a galaxy? Yes, a galaxy is a family of stars. A a that's how you would describe yes, it? Yes, a hundred billion stars moving together under the mutual gravity in a giant spiral pattern like Andromeda. Now, our galaxy is the Milky Way. That's right. So, what was at the beginning then? It was like a cosmic egg. The universe began with this big bang of hydrogen and heat, in which all the energy and ultimately all the matter of the universe was concentrated. Uh-huh by finding that the more distant objects moved faster and faster away from us, we deduced that it was not just a simple motion, but that space itself was expanding. The sun gave birth to the planets, we think, in a much more peaceful way, at a very low temperature, in fact, against this enormous temperature measurable only in the billions and billions of degrees at the beginning of time. What was the Earth like originally? Well, we sort of think it was like these pockmarked planets that we see from space now, covered with debris formed by the gradual accumulation of impacting small asteroid-type bodies, hunks of rock hurtling in. The early history of our planet and the origins of life on it remain shrouded in mystery. Scientists can only speculate on the convulsions which led to the formation of cells capable of reproducing themselves. In one of my favorite poems, Langdon Smith says it best. When you were a tadpole, and I was a fish, in the Paleozoic time, and side by side on the ebbing tide, we sprawled through the ooze and slime. The eons came, and the eons fled, and the sleep that wrapped us fast was riven away in a newer day, and the night of death was passed. Thus, life by life, and love by love, we pass through the cycle strange, and breath by breath, and death by death, we follow the chain of change. With space exploration, we look through our own solar system, a rough dozen planets and 20 satellites or thereabouts. They're all miserable places, you know, we wouldn't live there. Yeah. We seem to be in a very strangely fortunate world. What you're looking for most specifically is that other stars like our sun probably have planets around them, is that right? I was interested mostly, since there is a great interest and other intelligences and other worlds, and first finding if there was one other world in which anything could live. How many galaxies are there? Do we know? Well, we really don't know. That's one of the main goals of the study of cosmology and the expanding universe. But the guess is that there are somewhere between hundreds of millions and some billions of galaxies. Galaxies. And each one has a population of a hundred billion stars like our sun. There's no end to it. The real problem... Is, is there no end to it? We don't know. That's like, oh, really? We, we don't know. Science is built... Science up. cannot tell you that. It's not yet. We look at these things. We look at more and more distant ones. We strain our equipment and our mind. It's the process that we're trying to find out. Yeah. Because there's no point in giving an answer in advance. Doors beyond doors. I wish we could see through them. Yeah. It's going to take very special means. It's going to take different kinds of telescopes. For example, work in the infrared, where you detect the heat radiation of a planet relatively more easily than its reflected light. We also send messages into space, abstract attempts to explain who we are. Since life as we know it is most probably near stars like our sun, we aim our electronic ears in their direction. Carbon is formed in stars, oxygen is formed in stars. Yes. Everything else was born in stars. We're born of the same kind of material from stars. So if that is the case then, and we feel that all the materials are pretty much the same in the universe, then if there is another planet in a situation like ours, what are the probabilities that this creation of life, living organisms, 
Does that get to be probable then? To me, it would seem that the fact that we are made of the commonest elements synthesized by nuclear burning and stars make us. So it's very difficult to believe that if there's a platform at about the right temperature, that life might not develop spontaneously. Well, that's pretty far out, as you would say. Yes. <laughs> but it's true also. Yeah. You couldn't sit up in that chair eight or ten hours a night without having some belief that there'll be novelty. Well, life is the ultimate novelty. But novelty implies unpredictability. And nowhere is it chiseled in stone that life, if it exists beyond the Earth, would necessarily have evolved the same way it has here. A tree-like creature, capable of movement, guided by some primitive impulse to seek the nutrients necessary to survive and reproduce, may be the ruler of some alien planet a billion light years away. Harvard's Nobel Prize winning biologist, Professor George Wall, believes emphatically in extraterrestrial life. He said, I think there is no question that we live in an inhabited universe that has life all over it. That sense of wonder is what forces us to work, and it may be that, that sense of uh, striving for the impossible. But it is precisely this sense of wonder, of curiosity, and our compulsion to satisfy it that sets us apart from all our fellow creatures on Earth. Perhaps our search will lead us to discover that the king of some distant planet resembles one of the giant predators of our own ocean, a throwback, by earthly definition, to a time before animals had crawled out of the water to survive on land. No one can predict where our sense of wonder will take us or what we will find on the voyage to distant worlds. And it would be rash of us to assume that man represents the highest form of life in the universe. Compared with what we may discover, we may be more primitive than this monarch from the depths of another world. What about intelligent life? So first you've got to look. Without information, there's no knowledge. We have to expect miracles, but we have to make them work. It may be presumptuous to assume that an alien creature could resemble us, but considering the odds, it's just as presumptuous to rule it out. And it might not only be similar, but far superior. Astronomer Richard Berenson had this to say of life on other worlds. The question has become not so much one of if, as of where. And who knows? Many of these forms of life are possibly far more technically advanced than ourselves. How would you define science? What is science to you? So science is the use of the most sophisticated technologies which one can develop to satisfy individual aspiration. It's a song, it's a, it's a dream where you're limited by reality, but you can twiddle a lot of knobs to manipulate things, too. I love that, that you said it that way, that science, too, this incredible mathematical, organized thing, is a song. It's a dance. It's a miracle. It's a work of art. Human beings are pretty incredible. My name is Cole Palin, and I've been working on these things, really, all my life. Why did I start the Rhinebeck Aerodrome? I just thought old airplanes ought to have a fine old home. Why are people interested in old airplanes with such marvelous, sophisticated airplanes flying around today? With the old airplanes, it can be one man by himself controlling the whole situation. I think it's human nature to want to do the whole thing themselves, the individuals. Oh, that thing's going to need some grease. Hmm. My name's Dave Fox. I've been flying here for 25 years at Old Rhinebeck and enjoying every minute of it. I started flying in 1934 in Texas, and I've got about 20,000 hours now. And I guess these are more fun than anything else I've flown. There's not only a certain amount of ego to it, but there's a euphoria that comes over you. If you fly the thing and fly it well, you know that you've done it. And nobody can tell you there's no electricity, so there's obviously no radio for somebody in the ground to tell you you're doing wrong or what you're supposed to do next. And of course, 
It was always a thrill to uh, get up and look down. There's nothing quite like it on a beautiful day. You break out and see the ground for the first time. It's a, it's a thrill. I never got over that. The crowd jammed the bleachers every summer weekend here at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome, a hundred miles up the Hudson River from New York City. What they've come to see is an old-fashioned air show put on by some of the best stunt pilots in the world. The planes they fly are the tuned-up relics of World War I, open cockpit planes with names like the Sopwith Camel, Spad, Jenny, the Fokker DR-1 triplane. These are the planes that made legends of the famous aces, Emmelman, Rickenbacker, and the Red Baron himself, von Richthofen. Here at Rhinebeck, the legends are gently kitted. Like the aces they are spoofing, these pilots too fly by the seat of their pants. But their dog fights are more bark than bite, and their bombs more smoke than shrapnel. circus, you don't need a program to tell the bad guys from the good guys. The damsel in distress may be tied to a barrel instead of a railroad track, but nobody doubts for a minute that she'll survive. The heroes are all pure of heart in this nostalgic look back, and we know before it's all over, the villain will get it in the end. The uh, space program, I think it's a marvelous thing. My father delivered mail in a horse and buggy, and he lived to see Sputnik. A wonderful time to be alive. The use of space is going to be necessary to continue the progress of man. It's going to lead the way to long-term space population. There are actually going to be generations within the next hundred years who were born and raised in space. To keep it going, they're going to have to make the space shuttle do things for people because people is the key to anything we ever have done as a nation or will do as a nation. In 1948, the experts said it would be another 200 years before we'd make it to the moon. But in 1969, this Saturn V rocket was the initial stage of a delivery system which carried two Americans to its surface and brought them safely home. Today, this rocket is practically obsolete. The space shuttle has been born and with it the promise of new and even greater discovery. It's kind of hard to imagine, but someday even the space shuttle will become obsolete as we continue to step into the future and out of the past. So what does all this mean, these dreams of the past turning into modern day reality? Well, I'm convinced that it means that we can accomplish just about anything we set our minds to. We can continue to solve the most difficult problems that we face here on Earth, and learn new ways to improve the quality of our lives and the lives of our children. But first of all, we have to decide that that's what we want to do. And then we have to learn how to work together toward those goals. I know that it's true that you have to climb to the top of the mountain to see the other side. Well, we wanted wings, we got them. And we're beginning to use those wings to fly beyond familiar peaks to the far side of those mountains. We can't not do it. We must continue our exploration. We must open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to accept being the first among humans to enter the far reaches of space. <laughs>